So I'm primarily a scholar of literary and cultural history. Literary criticism is the study uh, of the process by which we make our personal and cultural symbols meaningful to ourselves and to others. And today I'm going to focus on the way Armenian-Canadian filmmaker Adam Agoyan has taken on a related project with his 2002 feature film Ararat. Incidentally, how many of you have seen the film? Yeah. Okay, fabulous. All right. Um, so Ararat was the first widely released explicit cinematic representation of the Armenian genocide. Does that work? Yeah. Um, but it was not Egoyan's first foray into portrayals of trauma and its impact on nationalism, cultural memory, and denial. Felicia's Journey from 1999, which was Egoyan's savvy reboot of the serial killer genre, focuses on both victims and perpetrators of terrible crimes. As Egoyan explained, what interested him most about that film was, quote, the psychology and politics of denial and how that affects both a serial killer and his potential victims. You can see this as uh, running up to issues in Ararat. Similarly, Ararat does not simply seek to document the genocide, but instead to reveal how a then 85-year-old event continues to have disruptive and even traumatic effects on a scattered Armenian population, and how the continuous denial of the genocide by the Turkish state exacerbates those effects. Grappling with the difficulties of representing and memorializing genocide, Egoyan's Ararat reveals the long-term influence of the event on a renowned <laughs> filmmaker's cinematography. It's notoriously difficult to find a frame uh, within which to discuss the genocide, whether in nonfiction, fiction, film, or so on. Because of Turkey's denial, the repetition of claims of denial within the very media which could and should have recorded the genocide combined with this generic dilemma of acculturation, make forgetting the genocide, and I put forgetting in scare quotes, um, deeply disturbing for Armenians. For decades, Turkish denial meant that survivors were under an inordinate, excuse me, inordinate amount of pressure to bear witness, often as the only remaining member of a large family. A young picture of Adam McGrain. Uh, descended from genocide survivors, Adam and his family emigrated to British Columbia from Egypt when he was three, where he experienced ethnic isolation. When he attended the University of Toronto, he was exposed to a larger diasporan Armenian community and could observe contemporary political and militant responses to Turkish denial. And as Ezra mentioned, in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a burst of Armenian terrorist activity against Turkish civilians and diplomats, and much debate in the diaspora community focused on the effectiveness, morality, and rationality of these acts. Uh, Egoyan himself admits that witnessing these acts, so he's talking about Asala and the other um, uh, terrorist organizations. Witnessing these events on television was overwhelming, and here his quote, I was completely torn. While one side of me could understand the rage that informed these acts, I was also appalled by the cold-blooded nature of these killings. Around the mid-1980s, he wrote a script about these violent responses to Turkish denial, but he quote, and this is his quote, wasn't ready to deal with the Armenian issue, and he never made the film. Yet allusions to the 1985 events return in Ararat, in the guise of Rafi's father, who was killed trying to assassinate a Turkish diplomat almost 15 years ago, uh, which would place the event in the mid-1980s. Okay. Oops. Okay, so in the longer version of the paper, I discuss how many of Egoyan's pre-Ararat films openly display emblems of Armenianness and how he specifically codes them with double meanings uniquely available to Armenians. And the Armenians here will catch this one, um, which is clearly a kind of high <laughs> representation with that little high. Um, could, you could also read it as the Mount Ararat. You might even read it as um, possibly also uh, an Armenian script. It depends how you think about it. Um, but this is kind of a key to the sorts of things he's interested in doing. And I'd be happy to talk about um, those examples at more length if we have some time after. But for now, I'd like to focus on this film, uh, which portrays survivors haunted by the memory of catastrophic events while specifically focusing on characters' attempts to represent the catastrophe of the genocide, both to themselves and to the world. At its most basic level, the film consists of intertwined plots. A contemporary fictional Armenian director, Edward Saroyan, of course played by Charles Aznavour, is making a film about the Armenian genocide by focusing on the Van uprising, which Armenian-American painter Arshil Gorky witnessed and participated in. Much of Edward's film is based on his mother's survivor testimony and the autobiography of an Armenian, excuse me, an American missionary who witnessed the event. 
Edward also consults Ani, an art historian and Gorky expert, who helps her son Rafi get a job as an assistant on the set. Rafi, whose dead father, we recall, was the Armenian terrorist, struggles with his own relationship to his Armenian past. He goes to Turkey, ostensibly to shoot background footage for Edward's film. And a Goyan's film is framed with Rafi's attempt to clear customs back in Canada. Rafi is interrogated at length by a customs agent, Christopher Plummer there, uh, named David, who has his own reasons to listen carefully for the truth. So one of the um, features here I should mention is that um, we're talking about a frame narrative, and that's a, a, a literary term that we use to talk about one story that's actually fit within another story. And this is something that uh, often is confused in discussions of the film. Okay, Gorky is vital to nearly everyone in Ararat, maybe to everyone in this room. Um, he's the film's most direct survivor of the genocide, and Egoyan represents him at various points in his life. As one of the members of the avant-garde art scene in New York in the 1930s, Gorky is portrayed struggling with his painting, the artist and his mother, an homage to his mother, who died of starvation during the genocide. Yet most of the Armenian characters in the film's frame narrative are at least a generation distant from the event itself, interpreting the historical event from their parents' stories and their cultural artifacts. And each takes on a role of representing the genocide to themselves and um, excuse me, representing the genocide to different audiences. Ani's first husband, Rafi's dead father, had the most treacherous and controversial mission of representing the genocide for the Turkish government as a member of a diaspora and terrorist organization. His son Rafi is a member of one of the youngest generations of diasporan Armenians. He's not only the Armenian in the film most temporally distant from the genocide, he's also grappling with the trauma of his father's death and reacting to the powerful feelings and ideas that led his father to become alternately a terrorist or a freedom fighter. Rafi's distance from real contact with the genocide seems to link him to danger and violence in ways in which he himself is not entirely aware. For Rafi goes to Turkey to shoot film, but in unwittingly or negligently becomes a heroin transporter on his way back. No, oops. Okay. Um, as these brief descriptions illustrate, Egoyan not only portrays the genocide, but also investigates how and why various people choose to understand and represent it to themselves and others. From the beginning of the film, Gorky's painting operates as a touchstone to explore how experiences can be transformed into a representation that will be interpreted by someone else. Consider the title sequence, which starts with a simple brown button hanging from a thread in Gorky's New York studio. It's a remembrance of Gorky's mother, as well as a sign of her attention and care for her son. The camera glides onto a photograph of them, which we learn at the film's end, connects the button to the moment the picture was taken and to the painting he is working on. Next, we see one of Gorky's many drawings of the photograph, particularly one with a grid that will allow the small drawing to be blocked onto a large canvas while maintaining its proportions. As the camera continues to glide through his studio, picking out objects, moving in and out of focus, we see iconic symbols of Armenian culture and homeland, such as the small khachkar, that uh, ornamental stone crucifix. Finally, the tools and media used to produce the representation come into view, the pencils, paintbrushes, palette knives, and tubes of paint. Egoin presents a representation in the middle of its production in process. And yet the film also implies that the danger of art, the danger of media, which this varnish is a pure form, is a danger that must be tackled and exposed. Right from the start, the film foregrounds the working through of a representation in all senses of working through, artistically, interpretatively, psychoanalytically. The title sequence follows the path and process of cultural symbolization. By framing the film with Gorky's painting and others' interpretations of it, Egoyan confronts a problem that Armenian artists and writers grappled with for years, as they searched desperately for an appropriate form and medium to give voice to at least the initial catastrophe. As Egoyan himself describes, speaking of the making of this film, how does an artist speak the unspeakable? How can a violent convention shattering genocide be understood within the more or less conventional realm of aesthetic representation? So one might argue that the way to convince anyone of the magnitude and evil of the event would be simply to let the testimony speak for itself, that is, to do, that is to depict an eyewitness account visually. Although there have been widely seen representations of the Holocaust, 
Schindler's List and Defiance are up there. The Armenian genocide goes virtually unrepresented in popular consciousness. Thus, a straightforward documentary representation of the genocide is likely to have a powerful effect on its audience. Egoyan portrays this type of representation via Edward Sarion's Ararat, and this is the movie within the movie. It's a feature film as historical documentary. Sarion effectively produces a horrified reaction in his audience. Near the end of Egoyan's Ararat, we see people watching the opening screening. And this is an interesting scene because it's full of what we call reaction shots, the audience perceptibly disturbed by the images of the genocide portrayed on their screen and at moments on our screen. They cover their mouths in shock or shake their heads in disbelief. Early reviews of Egoyan's Ararat yearn for this cathartic movie experience. Here's Anthony Lane of The New Yorker, who wrote that Egoyan should have made an exemplary documentary on the subject of the slaughter and asked Osnivore to talk us through it. Lane wanted Saroyan's Arat and less of this contemporary story of young Rafi, Ani, and others. Considering the lack of a widely released dramatic movie on the genocide, critics asked why Egoyan didn't simply film Saroyan's Arat as his, sar as his Arat. And I'll say as an aside here that Egoyan actually wrote an entire straightforward narrative screenplay of the film within the film. He has that whole thing, uh, and he never filmed it. He just filmed shots of it. So on some level, he could have. For the remainder of my time, let me offer some possible answers to this question. First of all, Egoyan underscores that even a straightforward representation based on an eyewitness account is at least once removed from the event itself, exposing a documentary to the charge of manipulation or falsification. Egoyan wants to tackle this problem head on. One point of the lengthy interrogation of Rafi by David, who's the customs agent, is to underscore the difficulty of establishing truth from a single person's narrative. A customs agent asks questions to expose a simple set of facts, as I was just asked two days ago. Who are you? <laughs> Where are you traveling to and why? What are you bringing into our country? Egoyan reveals that these seemingly obvious questions are, in fact, existential questions for a member of the Armenian diaspora, such as Rafi. Rafi interprets these questions differently than David intends them, hearing, who am I as an Armenian in Canada? Why does a diaspora in Armenian travel back to Turkey? What images, ideas, dangers do I bring back from where I've been? But whatever questions David asks and whatever questions Rafi answers, determining the truth by listening to someone speak is a difficult task. No wonder that before opening the cans of film, David voices his frustration. What are we going to do? There's no one I can contact. There's no way of confirming that a single word of what you've told me tonight is true. Rafi's response, everything I've told you is exactly what happened is more or less true of the genocide, but it's not actually true of what he brought back with him inside the cans of film. There is actually heroin inside the cans of film. The point here is that all representations, including the representation Rafi narrates to David about who he is, where he's been, and why, are mediated by some person or thing doing the witnessing or recording. Had David chosen not to listen to all of Rafi's story, but merely employed what he calls a drug-sniffing dog, the complicated truth that Rafi told of both the genocide and the film cans would have been lost to David. Genocide deniers have distorted these intrinsic qualities of representation and of evidence to reject the truth value of survivor testimony, employing radical skepticism to argue that because a lie could be told, no truth can ever be told. Ignoring all contrary evidence, Turkish organizations claim that Armenian nationalist interviewers coach survivors in order to conclude that the testimony must be false. Within this context, we see one crucial reason why Egoyan's film is not Saroyan's film. It enables Egoyan to answer and dismiss the charge of falsification within the film itself. By explicitly dramatizing and refuting these arguments within the narrative, Egoyan effectively responds to Turkish denial on his own terms, undermining the Turkish government's facade of presenting a balanced argument. And I might also add, um, in response to earlier panels, that Egoyan is pinpointing a strategy to circumvent arguments about standards of evidence, states of limitations, and so on. So in some ways, it's a, a kind of response to some of the legal um, issues we've been talking about earlier. Another critical issue Egoyan is contending with is that violent graphic representations on the film screen are not just subject to manipulation, they are also manipulative themselves, exploiting the audience's feelings. 
Schindler's List induces cathartic identification in order to draw us into the action and maintain our absorption. But Egoyan portrays such audience absorption as dangerous passivity. Consider this discussion in Ararat, where Rafi and Ali discuss Ali's portrayal of notorious genocide mastermind, Jevdet Bey. Um, and you should know that Elias Kotias there is Greek, which is also, I think, sort of the pleasure of him playing Jebdet Bey in the film, within the film. Um, I was raised to feel a lot of hatred to the person you're playing, says Rafi. You really pulled it off. When Ali points out that Rafi was kind of prepared to hate any portrayal of Jebdet Bey, Rafi responds with a reaction that is essential to Egoyan's filmmaking. I'm also kind of suspicious of stuff that's supposed to make me feel anything, you know? Even though I know you were supposed to make me feel like hating you, I resisted it. This resistance that Rafi describes marks a crucial questioning, uh, excuse me, a crucial questioning distance between Saroyan's film and Egoyan's. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting here uh, that Egoyan is advocating some kind of emotional detachment uh, of some kind, but he is advocating a resistance to the kind of inculcated affective dispositions that Ron Suni was uh, discussing earlier. I think that is the uh, resistance he's talking about. Lastly, Probably the most important reason why Saro Yun's film cannot be a Goyans is that representing the horrors of the historical genocide only captures part of what the horror has become. The horror, a Goyan explains, is not only the genocide, but also the ramifications of the world not, be, not being told the specific story of horror. This is the horror of denial as it continues to reverberate. By focusing on what it means to tell a story of horror, Egoyan shows how everyone can be drawn into the drama of telling, listening, and denying. Not only the most direct victims of the horror, but the survivor's children and grandchildren, perpetrator's children and grandchildren, and anyone who comes into contact with these descendants. In numerous scenes throughout the film, Egoyan not only presents imagined dialogues between Armenian generations, he also illustrates the implied challenge of authentic, first-generation genocide testimony, authentic, sorry, I should put that in quotes, um, to all future representations of the trauma. In other words, throughout Ararat, Egoyan is most interested not in the original genocide testimony itself, but in the various reactions to and interpretations of this testimony by later generations. Armenian characters in the film clutch particular symbols of the genocide and Armenianness. For Gorky, it's the photo of his mother, his coat button, for film director Saroyan, it's the spiritual image of Mount Ararat, while for Ani, it is Gorky's mournful painting. Rafi is clearly searching for such a symbol during his travels to Turkey, since part of the genocide's damage has been to, has been to leave younger generations without a meaningful symbol of memorialization. He records his despair while in the ruined town of Ani, quote, when I see these places, I realize how much we've lost, not just the land and the lives, but the loss of any way to remember it. But Egoyan's Ararat, unlike Rafi's or Edward's, attempts to make a crucial intervention in this proliferation of horror and loss, not by adding another symbol or fetish to the proliferation of symbols of Armenianness. Instead, Egoyan is considering how these symbols, such as the button, Mount Ararat, the Gorky painting, work and don't work in the Armenian diaspora. In Egoyan's Ararat, the interpretation of and engagement with these symbols constitute Egoyan's representation. This point, too, has been the message hidden in plain sight, not fully available to those audience members unaware of the genocide's troubled legacies. By mediating on the way Armenians handle their symbols, Ararat dramatizes one more way to forestall losses to Armenians and Armenian culture. Through the interplay of various stories and by animating characters motivated by a complex set of circumstances, Egoyan's Ararat conscientiously finds a way to represent the genocide that will neither lead to the generation of more horror nor to the generation of more denial. Thank you.